Thomas Essen says, my dad, a former engineer, occasionally criticized Mythbusters when he felt that a myth didn't need elaborate testing because to crunch the numbers on paper would show the physics were automatically busted from the start. This, <laughs> this, Thomas, I suspect you're throwing me a softball there. Because, I mean, obviously, you know, we're talking about te television, which means we're talking about commerce. And the commerce of television is you keep people interested and other people buy advertising while you're keeping them interested. Mm. Soap operas used to sell soap and still do. Um, but let's move past the, the softball question about, about this and say, um, He says, understanding that sometimes calculations can overlook a key variable, were some myths approached more from a standpoint of visualizing the precise mechanics of a failure as opposed to investigating potential validity? Those are, that's a good question. But for us, something being obvious on paper was nowhere near enough of a reason to eliminate a myth. What was the real deciding factor for us is how many people believed it. How, uh, and probably the clearest example of this is airplane on a conveyor belt. Okay, I can't believe I'm going to give this explanation again, but I will. So there's a myth that an airplane can't take off on a conveyor belt. Let me elaborate. The myth, as stated, says that an airplane is on a runway trying to take off. Let's say it's trying to take off in this direction. But the runway is a conveyor belt running in the opposite direction that matches the speed of the plane. Those are the parameters. The question is, can the plane take off? Now, until we did this episode on Mythbusters, there is, if you, you could print out thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of argument about airplane on a conveyor belt, um, which in and of itself alone is enough of a reason to tackle that story. Jamie did not want to tackle that story. He's like, why would we do that story? It's stupid. And to him, I said what I say to Thomas Essen's dad, which is, you may know that it is stupid, but in the unpacking of why people believe this, we're not just going to answer a question, we're actually going into the psychology of misunderstood physics, and that is an important part of the Mythbusters ethos, frankly. Um, so, <laughs> look, I'll tell you, just framing that question repeatedly, can an airplane take off on a conveyor belt if the conveyor belt is matching its speed in reverse? Just continuing to argue amongst our crew, me, Jamie, uh, I, Alice was on that, Steve-O, our production crew, Saws, everybody had different approaches to how that question should get answered. And it took us weeks to come up with the simple explanation I'm about to give you. And this, okay, so the simple explanation is that the question has a trick in it. When I say that the runway is a conveyor belt matching the plane's speed, you, most people assume that that means the plane remains stationary. And so a lot of the argument on the web is about the fact that a stationary plane can't take off, which is totally true. A stationary plane cannot take off unless it has a headwind that is faster than its takeoff speed. And I have seen footage of that, but that's not what's happening here. The plane will never not be moving forward. The question makes you think that the plane is stationary because you, he because you think of a car on a conveyor belt that is matching its speed in reverse, and we know that that car is not going to go anywhere. But, the pl but the, 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 for me, the clarity came in realizing that a car moves using the ground as its medium. An airplane moves using the air as its medium. Therefore, a car moves by adding kinetic energy to its wheels and they move along the surface. A plane doesn't do that. A plane starts turning a screw through the air, which pulls it forward. The wheels are only there to keep the propeller from hitting the ground. So the fact is, is that within the laws of physics, no speed that that conveyor belt is going will ever keep the plane from going forward. And because the plane can go forward, it will always take off. But even though Jamie thought when we were setting up that story, that it was ridiculous for us to do it and that it was a stupid myth to test. The pilot we hired to pilot the plane, we actually ended up, this is a great methodology and I can't remember who came up with it. It might've been Dan Tapster, uh, 
which was we dragged a half mile tarp from behind a heavy duty pickup truck on a runway. And then we put an ultralight plane facing the other direction on it and the plane was able to take off. But the pilot didn't think his plane was gonna take off. He, we interviewed him right before and he was like, I'm not sure, I don't think the plane's gonna take off. And he wasn't stupid. He was just misinformed about how physics work and the trick in that question. So for me, when I think about airplane on a conveyor belt, I was clear at the very beginning that it was a silly thing to be a myth, but it took weeks of psychological unpacking of the arguments that people had to come up with an explanation that made all the parts of that really clear. And that is a super useful exercise. Um, I have my Samaritan here on the table just because it's a, like a nice object to have nearby. Um, the other one is, I'll give you one more example which, uh, and then I'll move on to the next question, which is uh, early out of Mythbusters, we were doing one of our very first big stories, which was if a penny is thrown from the Empire State Building, can it achieve a terminal velocity that would kill you? Uh, and the answer is not only no, it's a, it's like a heavy duty no. And I think everyone remembers that. In fact, no one really believes in that myth. If you go to every level below the observation deck on the Empire State Building, they are littered with change. So either people are all murderers or they know it's not true. <laughs> the jury's still out on that one. But uh, we had from a NASA scientist a wonderful explanation of the fact that a penny is what's called a tumbling object and it has more than one terminal velocity. Um, more than one terminal velocity, you say? Yes. Most objects have a single terminal velocity, and I'll give an example. Um, let's see here. Yeah, okay. If I dropped this bottle from a plane, I can tell you that it is most likely going to fall in this orientation, not this or this orientation, simply because in general, on balance, objects tend to achieve a terminal velocity stability at their uh, orientation of highest resistance. So bullets fall out of the sky. If they're not spinning, they fall out like this. But a penny, uh, which is a disc, has two terminal velocities, one on its face and one on its edge. And like I said, we had this NASA scientist that had written this all up and I had done a piece to camera about it. And it was, I remember distinctly, it's like four months into filming, so it's like June of 2003, we're flying back from New York, having just filmed at the Empire State Building. And I'm thinking about this piece I've done to camera, which is like two minutes long, about the math of falling objects and terminal velocities. And I was thinking to myself, I'm just not sure that a mathematical description of this is enough. And the thing is, I just wasn't sure it was enough for me. Personally, I need things physicalized for me in a specific way. Your dad, the engineer, numbers have physical properties to him. He has been an engineer long enough where numbers mean world things to him. And most people aren't built like that. Um, and for me, I was thinking if I was watching this, my eyes would be glazing over at the numbers. I wanna see something. And so I ended up building a wind tunnel that showed that a penny had two terminal velocities. And in fact, I hypothesized that if I built it in this way, I put a penny in, it would go up and down. And when I put the penny in and it did go up and down, oh my, I can't even tell you what a deep endorphin rush that was. That was the moment that I learned that I had something to contribute to this show, that I had a point of view about pieces to camera that were much more physical than mental. and I. That's a frame I brought that I felt like, again, was something that I could contribute to this endeavor. Um, so that's why we would often do stories that to some engineers would be patently ridiculous, but to your average punter, as they say in Australia, to your average man on the street, uh, it's totally believable. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are, of course, below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects questions. You get to ask direct questions during my live streams, and we have some members-only videos, including the Adam real-time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.